All right, folks, so let's get a little bit more art and literature here from the Italian Renaissance. We'll look at Raphael Sanzio. And Raphael, if you look at his painting again, we're dealing with perspective. Uh, we're dealing with realism. Okay, you can see it's another self-portrait. It's another selfie. Um, but Sanzio is definitely a, another artist that's going to incorporate a lot of religious uh, aspects of society and a lot of secular aspects of society and kind of meld him into one uh, type of art and again he's gonna be known as the next church's artist after Michelangelo so if we look at him all right, the first thing you gotta know is he definitely blended Christian style and classical style one thing Raphael is gonna paint a ton of are Madonnas okay the Virgin Mary so the Madonna and child is gonna be one of his big big artistic works all right, he's going to use perspective like most artists did. And, of course, you can see it's very, very well taken care of. It's very good. Uh, he's a center point. You can tell he's on a balcony uh, overseeing a valley below him. All right, so here's probably one of his most famous pieces of art. This is the School of Athens. When we talk about using perspective, we're also really talking about linear perspective. So if I zoom in, you can see where the center point of the painting is right here in the middle. Okay, and it's really the two people that are focused on here. And again, this is blending classical, Christian, modern, uh, Roman, Greek, all these different aspects of society that are being melded back into um, the Renaissance time period. He's got Aristotle and uh, Socrates, not Socrates, Aristotle and Da Vinci as the middle point here of his whole painting. All right, so he's taking two great minds of the two different time periods and placing them in the middle. He's got Michelangelo sitting very in the front here, contemplative. He's got Alexander the Great that is sitting over here. He's got Zoroaster for Zoroastrianism and early monotheism sitting there. He's got <clears throat> Ptolemy, if I can move my face out of the way. He's got Ptolemy down here talking about the earth at the center of the universe he's even painted himself into the painting right there so he is part of these great scholars and this painting is called the school of athens now you're dealing with a very secular type painting and it's located in the church's library all right you can tell it's on a wall here's a door down here in the corner all right and you can see with perspective you know start counting the rooms that you see in, in the painting you know you have a room in the back another room here in the middle the room that they're standing in plus you gotta count the room that you're standing in and the symmetry of the painting is phenomenal we'll get into it again more in class but you can see a lot of what's going on with different scholars and different thinkers of many different eras all in the same place at one time and again it's referencing the school of Athens which is the early academia that was created through Socrates Plato and Aristotle alright here's a painting of his Madonna and child Okay, and if you notice, Madonna and Child, the Virgin Mary and the baby Jesus are young. Okay, they're young, they're white, they're blonde haired. They look like they should be in the Renaissance day. She is reading to him. He is grasping for her chest. Obviously a loving nature. It's a naked cherub, a naked angel baby, essentially, um, that is here in this picture. And I'm going to show you another one in class. But with this Madonna and child, you can see the love and care. She is looking down to him as you knowing he's a savior. He is a happy child. It is a very, very serene area. And you can tell that she's sitting on a rock in front of a meadow and a lagoon and mountains in the background. So the perspective here, he, he's taking a very holy and religious idea, a Christian idea, and blending it back into a modern, or at least for him, Renaissance time frame. All right, now we look at a little bit of literature. The first writer we're going to look at is a man by the name of Baldessari Castiglione, and he is going to write a book called The Book of the Courtier. And this really deals with humanist life, the individual's life, in a person's court, okay, and how you're supposed to act within a person's court. It was kind of like a self-help book for how to act amongst nobility and how to, to be a noble, okay. And in saying this, so he's attempting how to teach people how to have manners while being wealthy and what to do while you're in the court and what men and women have to do how they're supposed to dress how they're supposed to look how they're supposed to act how they're supposed to speak it's really the self-help guide here all right now what he says is men and women differ men and women differ in a lot of ways okay and and 
here again, we have a very male-centric society, a male-dominant society, yet women are starting to have a little bit more, I guess, a foothold in what's going on. But how men are treated in the court and how women are treated in the court are going to be vastly different, and the expectations are much, much different between the two genders as well. For example, a man must be athletic and educated, must be able to hunt and participate in games, also being very well-educated, uh, very intelligent, very able to speak. But you don't want him to be overactive. You don't want him to be so fit that he's going to push people away. And you definitely don't want them to be arrogant. This is the idea of having a quiet confidence or a confidence about you, how you're supposed to act, but also in a way that you'd be treating others very well, treating a lady very well, treating other nobles very well. Hence the educated part. You'll be able to speak to a lot of aspects of society. You can talk about politics. You can talk about religion. You should be able to play an instrument. Again, going back to that individualist renaissance idea, but you don't want to be so good at it where there's no room to gain, there's no room to learn, and you're overly arrogant. You're going to push people away. Now, for women, okay, and this is kind of where it gets a little screwed up. And ladies, I'm sorry to tell you this, but when it looks at outer beauty, outer beauty is a sign of inner goodness. If you are willing to take care of what you look like on the outside, that shows you how much you care on the inside. Now, it's not always to be about picture perfect thin. That wasn't always the way, okay? But it was your aesthetics, how you carried yourself, how you looked, how you dressed, your manner by which you spoke really showed, at least in this case, what your inner beauty was. And for that, that was what made you attractive to men and made you courtable when you were in the court together. And if you could do different aspects like dance uh, and read, you may be even more attractive to men. But your outer beauty, the aesthetic quality, does bring a sign of your inner goodness, at least according to Castiglione. Now, on the flip side of that, the complete opposite of talking about how you should act in the court is Niccolo Machiavelli. And this should help you with your project, a little insight into him. But his book is going to be called The Prince. Okay, And obviously when you talk about The Prince, it is really a self-help guide on how to rule. Okay, So when you look at The Prince, he's actually looking at uh, Cesare Borgia. He's looking at the Medici family. Um, He's looking at the power people of Florence because that's where Machiavelli was. He was a statesman. He was a delegate from Florence who dealt uh, especially in the papal states. Uh, so Machiavelli had a lot of experience in politics, and he learned a lot about politics while dealing with these people, whether they be the, the ruling Medicis of Florence or whether it be Savonarola, which we won't talk about as much, but he is a friar who tries to change Florence, or whether it be a Borgia. And the Borgias have major, major control of Italy, hence a Borgia Pope uh, under Pope Alexander VI. So <clears throat> in The Prince, this is your guide on how to gain and maintain power, okay? But the problem is it's not pleasant, okay? It's very, very dark. Uh, it's very, very violent. It's very, very um, immoral in a lot of ways, but it's about gaining power. And again, we talked a long time ago about human achievement and the individual gains. Well, gaining power is definitely an individual gain and definitely a human achievement, okay? So for Machiavelli, what he says is at the end, gaining power justifies the means, and whatever methods you need to use, if you need to lie, you need to cheat, you need to steal, you do it. If you need to kill, you do it. It even says in the book to the point where if a man needs to have his knees broken or his legs broken, let it be done to gain the power and control over that man. So there's a lot of justification in violent methods and immoral methods as long as you get to the end point, which is to become a powerful ruler. The big part of the whole, the whole book is how should the ruler rule? And the question he poses, is it better to be loved or is it better to be feared? And there's, he goes in contemplated ways going back and forth saying, you know, here are the pros and cons to being loved. Of course, if you're too loved, then they walk over you. They become um, lazy. It does not become a good society. If you're too feared and the scare tactic is there, you may rule and you'll get rebellion. So what should you do? And what he says is it's probably better to be feared than loved. Being loved is not a bad thing, but being feared is better. But ultimately, in the end, if you are feared, you should not be hated. Hate is what brings about rebellions. Fear knows that they will keep order and control. The love is too weak, okay, even though some rulers be loved. And if you look at really good leaders, there is a sense of love or fear, but the respect keeps, you, keeps them from being hated.